it just, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing uh, privacy is dead, a surveillance state, and now it's really the, the best hope, the only hope to reverse that is in the hands of people who are using cryptography to build sort of different online platforms, right? So in that sense, that's one example. Um, the next uh, episode in my series, again, looks at the crypto wars, and the crypto wars didn't stop. It really looks at the first the first big battle, well, no, actually, the first big battle in the crypto wars happened in the 70s when um, RSA was, um, you, you know, these researchers at MIT um, published, a, were planning to publish a paper uh, explaining the first working public key system, RSA, and the NSA started to do anything, started to fight to prevent publication of that, of that uh, paper. That was the beginning and then kind of continued, simmered through the 80s and then in the 90s, it really heated up again, where the government is trying to, in a sense, outlaw end-to-end -end encryption, saying that you have to have a backdoor or they, re they recognize how powerful strong cryptography is uh, in terms of empowering individuals um, in relationship to, to the government. And they wanted to see if they wanted to stop it. And they're still trying to Hey, how are you all doing? Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm really excited to announce Jim Epstein, my special guest uh, on this episode. He's the executive producer, uh, executive editor at Reason TV and Podcasts. And he just produced uh, recently a four part series of Cypherpunk's Write Code. And the first two parts I've already watched, it's, it's really incredible. Uh, you should definitely watch it. You get really deep down into the rabbit hole of, you know, how this whole uh, journey began with, um, you know, also, um, especially in connection with Bitcoin, you know, because uh, uh, there's also an article by on reason.com uh, by Jim Epstein. Uh, it's called, How Will Bitcoin Lead to More Freedom? The 1978 debate that foreshadowed the divide in today's so-called cryptocurrency community, and um, and you should also check out uh, the, uh, the the YouTube channel a Reason TV, and the first part is before the web, the 1980s dream of a free and borderless virtual world. So, you know, so Reason uh, 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 Reason is the planet's uh, or as they call themselves uh, the leading source of news, politics, and culture from a libertarian perspective. And uh, you, you, will, you will get sort of point of views you won't get from legacy media. And it's about, you know, the 19, early 1990s where a group of mathematicians, uh, hackers, you know, and cryptographers call themselves the cypherpunks came together around a shared vision, belief that the internet would either demolish society's artificial walls or lay the groundwork for an Orwellian state. They saw cryptography as a weapon against central planning and surveillance in this new virtual world. And the philosophical, philosophical, philosophical and technical ideas explored on the Cyberpunk's widely read email list, which launched in 1992, influenced the creation of Bitcoin, WikiLeaks, Tor, BitTorrent, and the Silk Road. And the Cyberpunks anticipated a promise and the peril that lay ahead when the internet went mainstream, including new threats to privacy and the possibility of building virtual platforms for communication and trade that would be impervious to government regulators. So really fascinating. Check them out. And uh, and if you found this episode interesting, like it, please share, retweet, like, subscribe on my YouTube channel or my different podcast platforms. It's the heart blood of my work. And thank you so much again. And without further ado, this is my talk with Jim Epstein, the producer of the four part documentary series, Cyberpunk's Right Code. Have fun. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. I have a very special guest. I'm really excited to have Jim Epstein, the producer of the, the documentary series, uh, Cypherpunks Write Code. Uh, Jim, thank you so much for your time and coming to my show. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Honored to be a guest. All right, Jim. Um, I, I watched uh, two video parts that are already publicly available. Is that is that correct? Yep, that's right. And I don't know when, when this is running, but basically running these every Wednesday and there are going to be four parts total. So this coming week, we're going to have a, 
um, another piece which is going to get into the topic of the crypto wars, especially in the 1990s. Um, so, and then there will be one part after that, which I'm calling Bitcoin and the end of history. And it kind of wraps, that's going to be the longest, most complicated piece. And it kind of oh, finishes wow. up okay. my story. Although, oh my God, there's so much I've left out. There's so much <laughs> to this story that, I mean, the total, my four parts come to about 40 minutes. And I also wrote an article that connects some of these themes to the current day industry. And I mean, like, I don't even get into Hal Finney, for example, who, you know, was just a, a major player in the development of Bitcoin. He was involved in PGP, such an important, important cypherpunk. There's so many trajectories and issues that I, that I just didn't get into in, in, in these videos. So, um, yeah, I mean, it would have to be like a 55 part series and uh, I'm, I'm given how long it took me to, to get these together. Um, I'm, yeah, I don't have an, enough years in my life to do that, but, um, but I would enjoy it because it's such a great topic. All right. Look, uh, this is a, you know, Bitcoin podcast show. It's a total Bitcoin podcast show. So, um, and I guess you know, most of my listeners, they are totally acquainted, you know, with terminologies like cypherpunk, uh, you know, but could you just let me maybe break it down? I want to know also, you know, where do you come from? Why did you do this? Um, you also are the executive producer. You did all, also the, I think, as far as I know, also the voiceover and everything else and with your team. Uh, what was the reason, the purpose behind it? Whom, whom did you talk to? What did you encounter during your, your research, you know, talking to all these brilliant minds? Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit of background information. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I mean, my sort of my day job, so to speak, is I'm the executive editor of video and podcasts for Reason magazine. And we've got a big team, you know, we're putting out between three and five documentaries a week. And I'm sort of overseeing that operation. Um, and I, uh, you know, make documentaries myself. I've written a lot of articles for Reason. I've, I've been there for about nine years. Um, but I, um, in terms of this, so there, I do find time in my schedule, at like little bits, hours in the day, a little bit here and there to, to do some of my own projects, which I, you know, are important to me. Um, and it was a number of years ago that I started collecting interviews um, with some of the old cypherpunks. So like, for example, um, I traveled out to the Bay Area because I was going to do a piece about um, the autonomous vehicle industry, just a short piece. And I said, you know, while I'm here, I'm going to stay an extra couple of days and I'm going to see if John Gilmore and Tim May, um, I'm trying to think who else I got on that particular trip. Um, uh, I think that was a trip where I talked to Gail Pergament, who is Phil Salen's widow, who's, who's a uh, figure in my documentary. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, that was later. That was a different trip. But sort of that was the idea. I would tack these on to other things. I found out that Whitfield Diffie, who's, you know, one of the, um, one of the people who discovered public key cryptography was going to be driving through DC. We have an office in DC. So I caught an Amtrak up and I interviewed him for the day. So I was kind of collecting these interviews for a while um, because I became totally fascinated with the cypherpunk movement. Um, and that's because I, you know, I'm obsessed with Bitcoin. I, I, I got uh, into Bitcoin, hard to say. I know I first heard about Bitcoin when I was listening to Russ Roberts' show, Econ Talk, uh, and he had Gavin Andreessen on. And I remember I was living in Maryland at the time, washing dishes, listening, and just thinking to myself, this is never going to work. This sounds ridiculous. And that was the first time I heard about it. And then it was a couple years later that I don't remember what it was that I read. It might have been even a Bank of England paper. I don't remember where I had sort of like that, oh shit moment where I was like, oh my God, like this is, I, it started to dawn on me what an important technology this was. And I, you know, ever since then have been totally obsessed with Bitcoin. I mean, I think Bitcoin is the most important technology. Um, I, I, I have sympathy. A lot of people write on Twitter things like, I can't, what if we had a world without Bitcoin right now where you know, there's a lot of, and, and I totally feel that. I, I'm totally in sympathy with that. I'm so grateful for Bitcoin. It's, it's the technology that gives me the most hope. Um, I, I'm a site, you know, one of the credos, sort of the tagline of the cypherpunks were, was cypherpunks write code. And that was a line uh, written by, um, by Eric Hughes, who was one of the co-founders of, of the movement, um, a, a mathematician who was living in the, the Bay Area at the time. And 
I, I sort of, I, I personally agree with that philosophy. I think that technology often drives history. The idea being that um, we're not gonna stand up on our soapboxes and um, lobby for one policy change or another. We're going to um, build something that's gonna change the world. And that's, that's, bit, that's sort of the essence of Bitcoin in my, in my view. Um, not that, I mean, some of the cypherpunks like Tim May, who was the other founder and the most influential member of the cypherpunks and a friend of Eric Tews, he kind of is absolutist about that. For example, at one point, cypherpunks were going to festivals and handing out discs of uh, PGP software, or they were planning to do something of that sort. And Tim May was like, we don't need to do that. Like his, his idea was just, just build the tools and, and that will drive history. So he was, he was a little bit more absolutist about it. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I mean, I do think that um, lobbying and, and getting up on a soapbox can, can make a difference, but I'm most interested in how technologies change the world. Great. So, um, you know, there's all, uh, as I also uh, read this article, um, which uh, uh, you had sent me, uh, it's called, How Will Bitcoin Lead to More Freedom? What I'm interested in, with all those people that you talked, uh, was this like, you know, when we talk about Bitcoin or cryptography, mathematics, it's, uh, and uh, there's sort of, um, it's the formulation is sort of, uh, you know, it's 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 a tool. It's an instrument um, against central planning. You know, authoritarianism, dict dictatorship, uh, central planning, and 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 you know th these kind of things. So, was that like what was the like the initial? Was this sort of a common vision amongst all these uh, you know cryptographers, mathematicians, all these people, you know, hackers? Uh, was it something that that united them in their vision, in their intention? Um, yeah, I mean, they were, it was a somewhat diverse crowd, um, and you found a sort of different politics going into it, certainly. Tim May said that people became, on the list, became progressively more libertarian as the years went on. They kind of, you know, started to, so there was sort of, sort of more uniformity amongst them over time. Um, I mean, what, what, certainly what they had in common was they were fascinated by cryptography, and its potential. And particularly, remember the list is really emerging like 1991, 1992, when the World Wide Web becomes available. They were really interested in how you could apply cryptography to the web or to the internet more broadly. Um, so that's what, that's what united them. Um, my story actually begins earlier um, in, the, in the mid to late 80s, um, even before the web. Um, and the kind of the precursor to the cypherpunk movement, and it was Tim May, and then also this this group um, of, uh, of computer scientists that were uh, worked at Amex, which was the American Information Exchange, and also uh, something called Project Xanadu. Um, and I, I think what these guys had in common were that they they thought they, they the web hadn't come yet, but they but they knew that something like the web was coming, that we were gonna have information or, or sort of a, a, a world of personal computers that would be networked and exchanging information, sort of a, a, this great communication tool. And they were incredibly optimistic about the potential of such a system. They thought that if we built the right tools, it could bring freedom to the world like nothing else. They, they, re they really saw that. Um, and so with a project like Project Xanadu, which um, was this idea to kind of hyperlink the world's information, similar to the web, but a lot more sophisticated, which actually originated in the 1960s, but in the 80s, it was a going company and they were actually trying to build this technology. And they saw the web as something that would um, improve human discourse. It would help us find truth better as a society. It would make information more available to everybody. Um, and then the American Information Exchange, um, which was the brainchild of an entrepreneur and economist named Phil Salen, that was kind of an e-commerce network for information. And Salem thought that it would improve economic coordination. It would improve the sharing of localized expertise. He was a, he was a follower of the Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek. 
Um, and he, he, he sort of really understood this technology in Hayekian terms. So those, these projects were related and it was, just, it was just this enormous optimism. On the other hand, they also were aware of um, this fear that computerized information would empower the surveillance state. And in my documentary, I use a book called The Rise of the Computer State, which was came out in 84, if I recall correctly, written by a New York Times journalist. And that sort of was a very prescient articulation of this fear. And they, they were on board with that too. So they sort of thought you could, if we built the right tools, we're gonna go in the freedom direction. If we build the wrong tools, we're gonna go in the surveillance state direction. And that's why the correct tools are so important. And what emerged by the early 90s was this understanding that cryptography was, was the most important tool. We could build on cryptography. It wasn't just a way of disguising messages. It, it could do so much more um, with the right development. I mean, a lot of stuff had to be built. So I think, I think that was sort of the unifying vision, although you'll find people you know, who dissent. I mean, like, like any movement or coalition, people were a little bit all over the place. You just mentioned Hayek. I mean, I'm a huge Hayek fan. And, uh, you know, he's, he's one of those, or if not the most famous quote of him is, uh, we cannot take, uh, sort of, I'm just paraphrasing it, we cannot take, you know, the power of, uh, of the over the issuance of money uh, away from the governments uh, violently. But what we can do is by a sly roundabout way introduce something. Was that a quote? Like, do you think that that statement, which he gave in an interview, I believe when he was uh, before his death, uh, uh, before he, I think just before he died, I, I, I believe so. Uh, was that sort of a because of a, due to an influence uh, because of uh, talks or you know conversations he, he had with with um, you know people like uh, like Tim May or whatever or, or or cryptographers, mathematicians, hackers was it influence. I mean, you know. Um, well, so Hi, I mean Salem did meet Hayek, and Hayek was a big influence on him. But Salem wasn't didn't, not to my knowledge, at least, he didn't write a lot about money. You're referencing, I mean, Hayek wrote a famous book called The Denationalization of, of Money, um, which was kind of, it was a groundbreaking book. It, it influenced people like George Selgin, for example, who was at the Cato Institute, as a fr fr kind of one of the theorists of free banking. It had a lot of influence in terms of because he, he sketched out a vision for how we could have a world of private currencies. Um, that's not actually one of my favorite Hayek books, and I've never seen in evidence that that book specifically influenced anyone in the cypherpunk movement. I, I've never seen, like, I, I don't know if, I, Tim May was well read, he probably did read Hayek, but I, I'm not aware of Hayek having a direct influence on May. They were talking about money early on, and um, sort of part of the story I tell is, Phil Salen had built this, I, this American Information Exchange, which was a, um, a, a web platform for selling information. They give an example of like, um, you want to invest in, in real estate in the Palo Alto market, and you're looking for someone who's an expert on the ground, and then you, you find that person, and you contract with that person, and you, you negotiate an arrangement with that person through what we could get into this if you want through what they call the smart contract, although some people will dispute that, that definition. Um, and it was like, well, we're going to have, we're just going to have all of the disparate life plans of people in the economy line up better. The economy is just going to work a lot better and we're going to just kind of be on this path towards freedom. That was sort of the, the idea. And ultimately, inefficient government will just kind of get edged out through this, through this sort of evolution of information that we're going to see on the internet. Um, Tim May took a look at this and said, I, no one cares, you know, surf, you can, the surfboard recommendation, who cares about that? Or more to the point, how does that really change the world? What we need is we need a version of this e-commerce site that's, that is beh hidden behind cryptography or that rather no, it's private. Nobody can, can see it and you can sell stolen information, something sort of akin to the Silk Road in a way, like a, an e-commerce platform that nobody can touch is kind of what he described. And um, 
this was I, this was actually before May really got interested in in public key cryptography. And Salen and May had this fascinating debate uh, over this issue. And one of May, uh, Salen's objections was he said, "How is anyone going to pay for anything on such a platform? Because um, you know you you can't you the only secret form of payment is cash." But this is an e-commerce platform. The whole idea is that you're transacting with people around the world, right? So you can't do a bank transfer and you can't do a credit card payment. So how, how are people, and so May started to think about this and that's what actually led him to get interested in the work of David Chom, um, who, who is you know, a genius cryptographer who um, first described in the eighties how you could have anonymous online payments. Um, and that really excited. May didn't think that the Chamian system was perfect, but it sort of pointed the way to him that you could build such a thing. Um, and that, that sort of sparked uh, May's interest. Now, if you fast forward to the Silk Road, um, the Silk Road, and May called this Blacknet. The Silk Road was not Blacknet. It was very different. They sold uh, all sorts of things, including uh, especially illicit drugs, but it used Bitcoin. Right, yeah. um, and they and sold they of, sold books initially. I heard. I mean, it wasn't really like drug was drug it? drug. It wasn't really a drug trading platform. I heard. It was more uh, primarily in the beginning. You know, mostly books on you know sold or traded on 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 Silk Road. Is that true? I books. you know I read I read um, the Nick Bilton book about Silk Road, which I, I think is flawed, and I know that um, the Ulbrich family is very unhappy with that book. I don't actually rem I don't actually remember that detail, but. Certainly, at some point, it was stuff that was that was explicitly illegal. Um, and how do you pay for it? Bitcoin, Bitcoin, and it couldn't. Have, if, if Bitcoin didn't exist, it couldn't have wouldn't have worked because Bitcoin was a way where you could settle without anyone's permission. If you were people were using their credit cards on the Silk Road, it never could have settled. Like you know, Chuck Schumer, who was one of the first people to start complaining about the Silk Road publicly. Um, I mean, they call the credit cards and the credit cards would stop processing the transactions Then there'd be no way to do business. Now, of course, problem that emerged was Bitcoin was a lot less, is a lot less private than people who were using it thought. And the government has ultimately tracked down a lot of users on the Silk Road. But that was, that, this was kind of the idea. And that's what got May really interested in cryptographic money um, re really, really early on. Um, and um, so... So I think I think so, you know that that's kind of the root of it, and then there was just this you know it was a long long road to um, to figuring out how to make it work because it was just this enormous engineering challenge. How do you how do you build a, a decentralized monetary system? Um, and and until Bitcoin came along. So you know. I mean, uh, Bitcoin or whoever or whatever Satoshi Nakamoto was, or one or one person or a group of people, but it was, um, as I also always understood it, is that it was sort of a, the accumulation or what do you call it, a bundling of of different elements of of already existing technologies. So in the course of your you know conversations with all these you know brilliant minds, uh, did it occur to you that it could have happened much earlier? The, the, the creation of Bitcoin, not much um, earlier, but at least, you know, years earlier before 2008 or nine. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm not, um, I, I mean, I, I certainly know something about the components in Bitcoin. I'm not an expert on it. I mean, people were, you know, there were versions of this. Well, first of course, and I interviewed Adam back. He's going to be in the mm -hmm. last episode. I mean, he, he came up with Hashcash, which became the basis of the proof of work system in Bitcoin, right? Um, and then I think it was Hal Finney who sort of applied his proof of work system to, to money. Um, so, uh, you know, and then there was the Weidai uh, uh, proposal, and then there was... Um, Nick Sabo's um, Bitcoin. I mean, the, the, these things were kind of coming together, but my understanding of it is that Satoshi certainly solved some major, major problems. I think a lot of, if you look at the history of technology, a lot of, so a, a book I like a, a lot called um, What Technology Wants by Kevin Kelly argues that um, at different times at the same world, like the steam engine was being built on one, one country and that was being built in another country almost simultaneously because 
there were all of these other discoveries that kind of all like a, like branches in a tree led there. So it was just kind of about putting together the component pieces in this grand technium. And that you find that with a lot of innovation, it could be an argument against patent law because people are kind of simultaneously discovering the same things at different times. For example, proof of work, just as Adam Back was figuring this out, he was unaware that some other uh, cryptography researchers were also coming up with the idea of proof of work somewhat different, but Bitcoin, I think, I think was, is maybe an exception to that. There were not like three people in di who didn't know each other in different parts of the world discovering, discovering Bitcoin, because I, I think it was truly a great leap. Um, I don't, it's certainly interesting that Bitcoin also came about after the cypherpunk industry kind of went silent. I mean, the list continued on, but after 2011, Tim May pulled back. A lot of people kind of pulled back. Um, and the, I mean, certainly September 11th and crackdowns over terrorism spooked a lot, a lot of people. Um, and, um, you know, and then suddenly 2000, you know, Satoshi drops his, his white paper and it kind of led to the rebirth of the cypherpunk movement, which is something I'm going to get into in, in the last episode in my series. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, yeah, and that was that was you know the final sort of stamp that he got into the code, uh, the chancellor on the brink of second bailout. So I think that was the perfect timing, also, right? Um, so was there uh, was there a moment when, or or yeah, you just mentioned it. Uh, you know, all these all these because when I reflect, you know, on the on the on the evolving situations right now around the globe, you know, with lockdown and more surveillance and, you know, the central bank digital currencies. Um, it, I mean, was it your intention with, th with that documentary series, not only to, you know, educate like historically and, you know, the background information, but also make people aware, conscious that, you know, what kind of fucked up world we're living right now. And this is the solution, you know, cryptography and, and math. And these are the people who actually helped us you know, get to here where we are right now, you know, uh, we still have to go a long way, but, you know, I'm like um, reflecting on the existing um, or the evolving situation conditions right now around the globe. It's, yeah, I mean, it's certainly, it's history that feels incredibly relevant. I mean, when you look at a book called like The Rise of the Computer State, which is I think 83 or 84, I'm forgetting the, the published date. It's an incredibly prescient book. If you look back at the things that um, that, that, um, the worries that are expressed in that book. I mean, it just, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're seeing. We're seeing, uh, privacy is dead, a surveillance state. And now it's really the, the best hope. The only hope to reverse that is in the hands of people who are using cryptography to build sort of different online platforms. Right. So in that sense, that's one example. Um, the next uh, episode in my series again looks at the crypto wars and the crypto wars didn't stop it really looks at the first the first big battle well no actually the first big battle in the crypto wars happened in the 70s when um rsa was um you, you know these researchers at mit um published a, were planning to publish a paper uh, explaining the first working public key system, RSA, and the NSA started to do anything, started to fight to prevent publication of that, of that uh, paper. So that was the beginning and then kind of continued, simmered through the 80s and then in the 90s it really heated up again, where the government is trying to, in a sense, outlaw end-to-end -end encryption, saying that you have to have a backdoor, or they, re they recognize how powerful strong cryptography is uh, in terms of empowering individuals um, in relationship to to the government and they wanted to see if they wanted to stop it and they're still trying to stop and it. they're still I mean, trying exactly yeah, yeah i mean this was news yeah. last week um <laughs> the the um it, it 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 just it never ends it's just they've kind of retreated to a different tactic and john gilmore talks about this a little bit in in my piece they have retreated to a different tactic which is to get platforms like WhatsApp or the, you know, the big um, messaging platforms to decline to build end-to-end -end encryption into their systems. But 
today, I mean, today, I believe what's what's uh, app is end to end encrypted, and that's a global messaging platform. I mean, that's a that's an incredible technology that we have that where you can message anyone in the world and it becomes impossible for anyone to read it. I mean, it's sort of like kind of like what PGP was, which was this for the first like encrypted email private messaging system um, that Phil Zimmerman was behind. And when Zimmerman released it, there was a criminal investigation. Was he guilty of exporting munitions? Because oh. this was this was cryptography was a munition. Yeah, was, that's, the, was the understanding at that? I was time. just going to address those questions. Yeah, like do you do you think a lot of these cryptographers were, you know, in some one way or another, either under surveillance or harassed or some kind of fri frivolous, you know, prosecution, you know, uh, or you know, or threatened maybe even. I mean. Is that possible? Oh, well, for sure. I mean, um, Zimmerman was under this criminal invest. He was never indicted, but there was a criminal investigation. Mm -hmm. They ended up backing off. Um, and what, what was so effective in the 90s, and, and I think you have to credit John Gilmore more than anyone. And I don't know if you know who John, or your <laughs> listeners know who John Gilmore is. You know, he was this, I think, an early Sun Microsystems employee who made a lot of money and left. And um, started the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is like a premier um, nonprofit that defends privacy rights uh, online. Um, and then he was a co-founder of the cypherpunk movement. He hosted the cypherpunk email list on his on his computer, which still seems to be running in his basement, the toad toad.com computer. He was important and developed Usenet. I, I don't know the whole, I can't articulate the history, but he's really, really a hero in all of this. And it, what he started to do was um, he made the case that um, cryptography software like PGP is code. It's code, it's software. Software is speech. It's like any other written document and it's protected by the First Amendment. And so one thing that happened was, I think it was, it was Phil Zimmerman who convinced MIT Press to print the PGP source code in a book and publish it and distribute it in, in foreign bookstores. So the idea was like, you can put the code in a book, therefore it's speech. Now let's, let's just see a judge say that it's illegal to write something in a book and sell it at a foreign bookstore. That's, the government was calling that exporting ammunition, but if it's just code, the first amendment protects it. And that was, that was kind of the big, a very effective legal tactic in the 1990s that they used. And I think Gilmore more than anyone was behind that. Although also Phil Salen, who's in the earlier part of my story wrote a great essay called Freedom of Speech and Software, which was also really influential and, and made a similar point as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, these issues, they haven't, sadly, they haven't gone away and they'll probably never go away. I mean, encryption is such a, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, public key cryptography is such a powerful tool that um, it's going to remain a big battle between the government and, and individuals and same thing for, for Bitcoin as well. I mean, well, I think we're, yeah. we're just at, we're just at the beginning. Exactly. Once Bitcoin yeah. starts to be, to really threaten, um, fiat currency, the, the power of governments to print money. I mean, it's, um, you're going to see uh, a big response, I think. Yeah. And, you know, when we talk about like patents or intellectual property, um, I think it's totally outdated. It's totally, I think it should be, it should be done obsolete because I think it's one of the main reasons why a lot of technologies, in my opinion, you know, haven't really advanced, uh, f you know, for the benefit of society or, or human civilization. Uh, when you talk to these people, I mean, open sourcing technologies, like, I don't know what it is called, now, but one of these encryption technologies just uh, sort of um, ran out of their, of the patent. Uh, and now it can be implemented. Was it like, is it like Taproot or Schnorr? I don't, I don't even, I'm not a techie. So um, is that like a path? Is that, was that a topic that you, you guys talked about? Like open sourcing, like this is the path forward, open sourcing everything? Open source software is a huge part of this story and i you know sadly that i put that in the category of the things that i did not get into which i you know which you know it would be in the 54 part series but it would come early in the 54 part series because it's so important the open source movement 
Um, and some of these, interestingly, um, some of these early internet pioneers didn't quite understand the power of open source. A lot of these technologies were, um, were, were patented. Um, and I think, I think one thing, I'm not an expert on this, but I think that when, when the Chom, David Chom patented a lot of technologies and it was, it was um, some of, when his patents expired, I think mm -hmm. that was, that, that had an impact. Um, RSA, I think, was patented. I mean, um, you're right about Schnorr signatures. That's a tech that I think that recently went out of patent and now it can be used. Um, so, um, but definitely the, the open source movement um, was something that was happening kind of at the same time as all this and is just kind of in the broader bucket of like computerized freedom and the decentralized computing. Open source is, is vital. Right. And Bitcoin and Bitcoin, of course, is, is open source <laughs> code and, and that's essential. Yeah. Jim, do you think the, the cat is out of the bag, like the Pandora's box been open and now, you know, we can be more we can just be be more optimistic, you know, going forward, because, you know, there's just uh, extreme directions it's taking. Actually, it's two directions. You know, it's either going totally more centralized, more authoritarian, more dictatorship like, you know. Or we're going really into more, uh, as Buckminster fully said. I think Fuller Buckminster said, you know, it's it's a waste of energy, uh, you know, fighting the old establishment or the old system. We have to create new systems, new new structures. So is that what we're doing right now? Is that also maybe the effect, the intended effect of your documentary series to wake up people, not only you know the general public, but also the people who are into this kind of knowledge, into this comprehension, to do something about it. You know, to to get together cooperate more instead of competing and really create those structures because um, I mean I don't to be I'm real concerned sometimes like are we at the juncture of like going more towards slavery or towards freedom I mean simply put mm. yeah um, I don't think it's determined I mean so the purpose of my documentary was really just to you know, sort of driven by something that fascinated me. I'm, a, I'm fascinated by Bitcoin and I wanted to understand better where it came from. Um, and I felt that um, there've been some good books about the cypherpunk movement, but I, I kind of wanted to delve into it a little bit and, and understand those roots. And then, you know, so that's that was really my purpose, understanding this history. And it's always amazing, like, you know, the issues we're struggling with today are not, it's nothing new. It's the same old, same old issues. Um, in terms of, I mean, I feel, I feel optimistic that these tools, ex because the, these tools exist, I think there's still just tremendous engineering challenges ahead that still need to be worked out. Um, so, and then of course, the biggest problem that this industry faces is you can build great tools, but how do you get people to use them? There's always been this trade-off between um, there's always been this trade-off between um, simplicity and, centri and, 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 and I mean, the sort of the more decentralized and privacy preserving tools tend to be harder to use. Right. And so it's, it's much easier to just use Gmail or Facebook or Slack than these other tools that are decentralized. And ultimately they're gonna succeed when it's not just people who are ideologically driven to protect or, or to use these tools or are hyper vigilant about their own privacy. You're gonna need the average person to wanna to use them. And the average person seems to not care that much about their privacy. So uh, one, another, another topic that I've done research on that I, that I wrote an article about and I did some related videos on um, a few years back was the use of Bitcoin in Venezuela, mm -hmm. which interested me because Venezuela seemed just like the ultimate use case, a country where the monetary system has been completely destroyed by the government. Um, and um, getting money in and out of the country was very difficult. There were capital controls, et cetera. And then what was fascinating about Venezuela was the socialist government made electricity essentially free. So you could set up a Bitcoin mine and not pay for your electricity. So then if you kind of knew what you were doing, it was a way to make money. And I found that in Venezuela, you had all these like small time miners who had like, you know, a few miners under their desk and were making a little bit of money. And that was also bringing some liquidity to that market. So of course, bringing liquidity to a market is the first big hurdle. And the mining story was doing that in Venezuela. 
but you see, I mean, I still, um, for example, um, my, my, I interact frequently. I've got a Spanish teacher in, in Venezuela who I interact with constantly. And I see, I mean, she, she's interested in Bitcoin. She knows about Bitcoin, but she has PayPal. And PayPal is working for her and her students pay her with PayPal and she's going to continue to use PayPal, but she's worried because PayPal could shut down her account. Um, but she, although she's interested in Bitcoin, she would start using Bitcoin when Bitcoin became absolutely necessary. And so I guess if things became a lot worse, for example, if these, um, it's not just PayPal, but platforms like PayPal that do still have Venezuelan customers that essentially are serving like acting like a bank. You can get paid, you keep money in account. Um, what if those started, if there was a crackdown and those stopped working, then people would turn to Bitcoin. I mean, unfortunately, it's sometimes when under a system of more, we need more severe repression, which I don't want to see, but that could also sort of lead us into a transition or we could see um you know hyperinflation in the united states where people are looking for um a a place to park their money that's not going to get destroyed so um i think i think adoption is the is is the biggest right. hurdle that's ahead right and individuals institutions are already you know uh starting adopting i mean if you've heard probably of michael strategy michael sale of macro strategy who put like 400 25 450 million dollars yes. yeah Bitcoin. and these just some of the few i mean uh, there's many others now that are going maybe even either sort of secretly or or very obviously very conspicuously uh, putting parking money because there's no other way because you know it's like sort of melting like an ice cube underneath their it's super cash exciting. reserves mm -hmm. it's super exciting but i mean i i mean i've been very fascinated by the lightning network as well i'm just i'm fascinated by i really want to see Bitcoin used in countries that by average people in countries that have failed currencies, because exactly. I think that's where in the short term, it can yeah. do enormous good. Yeah. Liberating people from nationalized currencies from government government issued currency. Yeah. And you just mentioned Venezuela. Um, uh, I don't know. Do you know Alessandro Cesare? I mean, we had we I had him on my show, and he's he's such a passionate Bitcoiner. You should definitely talk to him if if it's about I've Venezuela. Heard him, you should I've talk heard him to him. Interviewed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love I've to heard do heard a panel discussion with the mm -hmm. both of you. I mean, he's such you know, it's not only passionate, but he's got really huge knowledge about the insides of 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 Venezuela, what's going on, and. I had, I'm, I'm originally born, I was born in Iran. So we had this talk, you know, with a guy from India, Iran, Venezuela. So it's really very fascinating. Um, so this is, yeah, this is also, you know, my vision, my dream that people start uh, in those countries where it's, you know, either sanctioned or, you know, oppressive regimes or, you know, like in Iran and, uh, or, or hyperinflationary countries that people start, you know, going into critical adoption rate. This is really my 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 vision for for those kind of countries because then it yeah. would just be, you know, a chain reaction, you know, for every other country. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And it has to be, you know, it has to become the user interfaces have to become easier. Yeah. It has to be such that a, you know a total non techie can use it and maybe not know the difference between yeah. Bitcoin, you know, and and a, a, it looks the same. They don't even yeah. need, necessarily need to know that they're using Bitcoin. But this yeah. is a this is a safe place to put your money, um, and where no one will stop you from sending it to another person. Yeah, and UX, um, you know, UX, UI, you know, user experience, user friendliness, the product development has really improved. I mean, when I'm being told by other people who started like much much earlier, it's like this is totally different times. At least you know you have some kind of Trezor, Harder Wallet, whatever. You know, like there's so many like I mean, not many, but but there is you know a good selection of Harder Wallets you can you can buy and 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 store you know put it into cold storage it's got much easier but you know especially you, you just mentioned lightning network we have to go a long way i think till that is really you know where security privacy and the handling of the lightning network becomes much user friendlier yeah. so i want to respect your time uh jim um what are your like your final thoughts your uh what is coming up uh what are, can people look forward to where can they research or find you on twitter any other resources? Um, well, they can find me at Twitter at just my name, Jim Epstein, um, is my Twitter handle. And um, I, you know, all my work appears at reason.com. Um, they should subscribe to our video channel. Um, uh, you know, we do, we do do plenty of stories on 
uh, Bitcoin and cryptography. And we're going to keep doing stories on that. But we do sort of, you know, you'll find videos that come out almost every weekday on just like all kinds of topics that really from a libertarian perspective, well-made provocative documentaries, some comedy videos too. So to go to like, the, it's the Reason TV YouTube channel all that people should subscribe to um, and um, you know I don't once this project is out I don't have any other um, uh, videos that are soon to come out I have uh, plenty of other projects that I'm working on um, uh, sometimes I think it would be fun to be a full-time Bitcoin uh, reporter mm -hmm. I mean there's mm -hmm. there's no beat I would want more but but that's that's not uh, my reality at this moment. I'm working on a bunch of other stories. Um, I do want to. Where I really do want to do a story. I think probably the next thing up for our channel um, is to do something in depth on the Lightning Network, actually, because I think right. that's just so, so interesting. Um, so um, if you, you know, my my the next installment about the crypto wars is coming out this Wednesday, and then the week after that, I'm going to kind of wrap up the story and framing it around a lot of the optimism in the 90s. The 90s, were after it was after the fall of the Berlin Wall, really, mm -hmm. that you just, there was just enormous optimism about the direction that all this was going. And I kind of, that's kind of the setup that I use in, in this piece, like in, in that installment, like we're gonna have, the internet is gonna destroy trade borders. It's gonna allow us to trade and interact with anybody we want in the world. And now we're gonna have economic freedom too, because of these cryptographic tools being built by people like like David Chom. Um, and you know it, it turned out to be a lot more complicated than that. But then on the other hand, I think it's also it's a lot of doom and gloom, but it's important to also celebrate that to some degree that vision has been realized. I mean, we really do transact. I mean, you're, you, um, you're in Austria, I'm in New York City, we're interacting. I, I mean, the, the existence of WhatsApp, of, of global and, and encrypted, messaging systems. Uh, I mean, in some, the ease with which you find information online. I, when I was talking earlier about innovations that happen in different places at different, almost simultaneously and the creators don't know about it, that probably wouldn't happen now because we're just all so connected. And I think we are to some degree living the dream of the late 80s and the early 90s. But there's a big, big component of it that that still needs to be built, and I think that's that's kind of where the modern cypherpunk movement is headed. So. Wow. Okay. You know, uh, the reason also I invited you because I've not only because you're you know you're great film producer and video producer because uh, I'm working with other Bitcoiners too. We're, we're trying you know to do some Bitcoin commercials. Uh, sure. like literally like Bitcoin commercials to reach the masses, you know, to, mm -hmm. to have a sort of effect on people, like to, to make them think like, what is, what is, what is money? What is inflation? What is, what, what would the world look like in a deflationary world, you know? Uh, and where are they going to run in the U S or? No, no, anywhere. I mean, you know, oh. social media, wherever, just sure. short, you know, short clips, short, uh, meme clips or commercials, but also in English know, though. In, in English, English, in English, yeah, right. and we want to also work on on a Bitcoin trailer, like a short story, and then mm -hmm. finally, uh, you know, towards a Bitcoin film production, like a documentary, mm -hmm. like this. This I wrote an article about this, like how, what would human civilization look like in, in a world where it's rooted in Bitcoin, with you know mm -hmm. free market, free market uh, uh, principles, uh, deflationary, uh, you know, economics, such as Jeff Booth also wrote in his book, The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future, really worth reading. And I think this is, and I, I, I'm totally convinced this is this is our future. This is reality that we can manifest, but we need to, you know, create those layers of of freedom first, and that that's money, and that is Bitcoin, and that is maybe because why I'm in it, because I see a totally abundant and prosperous future rooted in Bitcoin. Yeah, well, it's exciting. <laughs> All right. I wish you luck with that. All right, Jim. Thanks so much again and talk to you soon, hopefully. All right. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. So how'd you like that? I really enjoyed my talk with Jeb Epstein. Uh, make sure you check him out on Twitter. That's Jim Epstein, one word. I'm gonna put those in the show notes and also Reason uh, on Twitter. That's uh, at Reason, right? 
and the YouTube channel is also really worth watching. Uh, you can also you know, uh, watch the first two parts uh, on recent TV. And yeah, uh, I didn't expect that it could go such a such a you know fascinating uh, down the rabbit hole. We just had you know uh, limited one hour, but I want to want to get him on next time, maybe in a panel discussion with other Bitcoiners, maybe with uh, you know Alessandro Cicero, maybe with Venezuela or other Bitcoiners. Uh, we can you know share thoughts and vision and uh, knowledge. So make sure please like it, retweet it, share it, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. Thank you so much for support. And if you have any questions, my DM is open. Um, my email address is hello at thetotalconnector.com. And yeah, and uh, the you know we have we have we have you know we have one choice, and that is Bitcoin. In, if we truly want to create, you know, structures of freedom, prosperity, abundance, privacy, and true freedom, then we've got to start, you know, with a root, and that is the monetary root layer, that is Bitcoin. So thank you so much again, and make sure you follow, subscribe, and write a positive review on any podcast platform. Thank you so much, and I'll see you soon.